His trademark is gunfire. His goal, grab the cash, no matter who gets in the way. In his wake, he leaves terrified victims, fleeting glimpses, and few clues for the FBI agents on his trail. But they are determined to find him and end this gunman's reign of terror. In the 1980s, the FBI matched wits with a cunning bank robber, a lone gunman responsible for the longest string of unsolved bank robberies in FBI history. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The robber's planning was meticulous. He executed his crimes with military precision. It would take the combined skills of local police and dozens of agents to catch a criminal mastermind they called the shootist. San Diego, California. On November 5th, 1987, the late morning quiet shatters with a gun blast in a local bank. A gunman orders customers to the ground, threatening to shoot whoever disobeys. The robber forces the teller to fill his bag with money from all the cash drawers, warning against alarms, die packs, or marked bills. He avoids the vault, which would take more time. This robber hits hard and gets out fast. Employees call police immediately. But even in the best case scenario, it takes several seconds to get through to an operator. And several minutes for dispatched units to arrive. By then, the gunman is long gone. Authorities conduct a full crime scene investigation. Although the man wore no gloves, he was careful enough not to touch any surface and left behind no fingerprints. Bank robbery is a federal crime. The case goes to the FBI. Bank robbery coordinator Special Agent Jack Kelly considers this gunman a top priority. He's a takeover robber, taking command of the entire bank rather than slipping a teller a note. It's a rare style, used in less than 5% of bank robberies. Even on the takeover style robbers, uh, most of them didn't fire weapons in the bank. So he was, again, a, even a smaller percentage of the small percentage of takeover over robbers that we had at the time. So from that aspect, he was considered to be much more aggressive and much more dangerous. Also, he doesn't use a partner inside the bank, as most takeover robbers do. His violence has a profound effect on his victims. The victims in a, in a takeover style robbery are, are pretty traumatized by the event, especially when there's shots fired in the bank. And uh, consequently, your uh, descriptions can vary dramatically. I mean, as far as the age, the height, the weight, everything. Some victims say he was wearing a disguise. Others disagree. The differing descriptions are of no real help, so agents turned to the bank's security camera photos. We did have some surveillance pictures of mediocre quality at that time, and it was not a, a great deal of assistance to us in trying to identify who this individual might have been. The photos show only that the robber is a white male about six feet tall with a beard and mustache. Agents face a serious challenge. No evidence left behind. No reliable description of the robber. Special Agent Kelly believes it's not the man's first time robbing a bank. Reviewing unsolved cases for similarities, Kelly suspects the same man robbed another San Diego bank a year earlier. The modus operandi was identical, with someone coming in the bank, firing the gun in the ceiling, vaulting the counter, 
similar description. The gunman left no evidence behind. The fact that there were so few clues was an indication that this guy was pretty good and he, he really probably planned these robberies very well. Soon agents learn the gunman is not finished in the area. It's after he robbed the second time in San Diego, he actually came back a month later and robbed a third time in San Diego using the identical MO and, and firing the shots into the ceiling. The robber's choice to fire his weapon makes him a deadly threat. I don't think a robber that does something like this would hesitate to shoot somebody if somebody actually tried to stop him. California? As a rule, Special Agent Kelly attaches code names to serial bank robbers to allow for shorthand communication among agents. Also, a catchy nickname increases publicity. The media would be more willing to pick up the, the story and to show pictures in the newspaper or on television, which would hopefully help us generate some leads. Kelly dubs this one the shootest for his distinctive and dangerous M.O. On December 14, 1987, the shootist robs a fourth California bank in Mission Viejo, 70 miles north of San Diego. It was my responsibility to review all the robberies that would come in from the surrounding regional FBI offices. FBI agents respond to the bank. When a robbery occurs, you do an investigation inside the, the bank itself for any evidence, but you also do an investigation outside the bank to look for evidence or any possible witnesses that may have seen this individual. And we did both on all these robberies. Yet they get nowhere, like they're chasing a ghost. So far, the shootist has stolen at least $44,000. But it's not just about the money. Agents worry that at some point he'll shoot someone. We're dealing with somebody we thought that was going to become more and more aggressive during the course of his robberies, and consequently more and more dangerous. And uh, it was somebody that definitely needed to be uh, identified and stopped. After a year-long absence from California, the shootist struck three times in five weeks. Kelly suspects the shootist must have hit somewhere in that year absence. He's got to be somewhere else. He's got to be robbing banks somewhere else besides California. Checking with other FBI field officers, Kelly discovers a string of similar unsolved robberies in Texas with dates that fit neatly into the gap between California robberies. During one of the unsolved heists, the gunman used the sort of violence agents have feared. In July 1986, a white male with a beard and sunglasses hit a bank in Abilene, Texas. After firing his gun into the ceiling, he forced the manager to fill his bag. As in California, he wanted only cash from the teller drawers and warned against alarms, die packs, or marked bills. The employees followed all instructions to survive, but then. No. No. Don't you move! The robber ran off, leaving the bank manager writhing in pain from a gunshot to the abdomen. Okay. Go lock the door, go lock the door. I need the police here right away. I'm at Everly Bank. We've been robbing the manager's been shot. Texas Rangers, the FBI, and EMTs responded immediately. The manager was gravely injured, but she survived. The other witnesses couldn't provide a solid description. It happened so fast, and they were so terrified, they didn't get a good look at the gunman. The crime scene investigation came up empty, and the security cameras provided only more photos of a robber with obscured features. Special Agent Kelly contacts the Texas Rangers, who are working the unsolved robberies. And investigators in the two states pool their information. They know the shooters targets branches near highway on-ramps for a quicker escape. The investigators agree the shooters likely has a getaway driver, but no car has been spotted. 
Each heist is as clean as the last, and no solid leads emerge. The shootist pulls off six more heists in Texas and California in 1988. Investigators hoped the media attention would continue. They need someone who recognizes the gunman to call in a tip. But because of the danger of this individual, we were hoping to get as much cooperation as we could, and we did. The local newspapers would run pictures of this individual. The local television stations ran pictures of this individual. With the ongoing media coverage, the shootist rises to infamy. His is an astonishing spree. 14 known bank heists in three years, all perfectly planned and executed. The shootist is destined to make FBI record books. A cunning adversary, like they've never seen before. By 1988, a man called the shootist has robbed at least 14 banks in Texas and California. Special Agent Jack Kelly. He was well organized and planned things out well enough where he didn't leave a lot to uh, track him with. What he does leave behind are bullets fired into the ceiling. If forensic examiners can find rifling marks on the slugs, they can run them through their ballistics database. And if the gun has been used in other crimes, they might get a lead on the gunman's identity. But that's a lot of ifs. Ballistics experts determined the slugs came from a 38 caliber revolver. But there's a problem with finding traceable rifling characteristics. The rounds that we did find uh, were pretty well damaged. Uh, they weren't really gonna be much benefit for identification as far as the rifling was concerned. The shootist continues his spree. His 17th known robbery is in the San Diego suburb of University City. Once again, no hard evidence remains in the bank. But outside, investigators find signs of just how meticulous the shootist is. It appears that before the heist, he loosened fence boards across his escape route so that after the robbery, he could reach his getaway car faster. Special Agent Kelly has chased more than 100 robbers, but this one's the most professional he's encountered by far. And you had to give him some credit, he was good. But you always had the hope that maybe there was some piece of evidence or some witness, some other part of the puzzle that you could put together. Yet despite a full neighborhood canvas, agents come up empty. By the middle of 1989, the shootist has made off with nearly $250,000. And he's struck in at least 10 different cities. Anytime an individual is mobile and he's able to move from not only city to city, but state to state, it, it really kind of complicates the investigation because there are multiple jurisdictions. Kelly brings together law enforcement from around the country. California and Texas FBI agents, local police, and Texas Rangers work together, determined to find that one clue that has eluded them. The more eyes and ears you have out there at the time, the more likely you are to get a break and, and, uh, and catch this individual. Because the shootist acts like a professional, agents suspect he has an arrest record for robbery. One of the logical leads to take is to look for people that just recently are released from prison and uh, maybe going back to their old ways again. Investigators asked about bank robbers released from prison in 1986 when the shootist spree began. But it's a dead end. No one recognizes the man. In the surveillance photos, it's difficult to determine what the man really looks like. And uh, the hair, the uh, mustache, it didn't appear to be real. I mean, it was extremely dark in color. The task force concludes the shootist likely uses elaborate disguises. 
wigs, mustaches, even makeup to change his complexion. When we first realized that uh, he was probably wearing disguises, we actually uh, took a number of the surveillance pictures to different uh, costume shops. Agents show shop employees the photos, asking if they recognize the man or the disguises. But it's another dead end. Investigators analyzed the shootist's bank robberies, hoping to find a pattern. They compare the amounts taken to the frequency of the heists and determine the shootist spends about $3,000 a week. When he runs low on money, he hits another bank. You were able to see, not necessarily a, a, a pattern, but you knew that he was going to need X amount of he, money after a certain period of time. Investigators note the shootist usually strikes on Mondays and Fridays and often robs different branches of the same banking companies. There were hundreds of bank branches in the general area where he hits. He was, he was just a, a kid in a candy store out there with trying to select where he wanted to rob next, and, and it was our job to try to outguess him. The team sets up surveillance on branches of the banks the shooter seems to favor. They watch on Mondays and Fridays, the robber's favorite days. It's a long shot. The problem we had was we had absolutely no idea where exactly it would hit. There were so many branches, so many targets. Sancho, this is team three, feet. Manpower is limited. Predicting which bank he'll hit next proves impossible. Bank robbers often use casinos to launder stolen money. The task force sends bank surveillance photos to casino security offices. One California casino responds with a good lead. A regular high roller there looks a lot like the shootist. They were willing enough to give us the, uh, their surveillance photos of the individual that they had suspected. Agents track down the man and interview him. He does resemble the shootist, but he has solid alibis for the robbery dates. Investigators eliminate him as a suspect. Another lead crossed off the list. On June 23, 1989, the elusive shootist strikes in Arlington, Texas, his 18th known heist. He has now hit banks over a 1,400-mile area. This time, a teller slips an exploding dye pack into his bag. When it blows, it renders the stolen money unusable. A few hours later, the shootist robs another bank. He's never struck twice in one day. It's a reckless move. Agents fear he's becoming more desperate. Special Agent Kelly fears it's only a matter of time before someone gets hurt. The more robberies that he did and the uh, more times he shot the weapon, including the time he shot the teller down in Texas, that's a great concern to law enforcement, obviously, because this individual, we thought, had a lot of potential for possibly killing someone eventually. And the way the shootist operates, he could take his next victim anywhere, at any time. In the late 80s, a team of investigators from Texas and California hunts the shootist, a cunning bank robber who begins each heist with gunfire, grabs the cash fast, then disappears without a trace. As the robberies pile up, the shootist becomes infamous in the Western US police community. Everyone's on the lookout. Special Agent Jack Kelly. Anytime in any jurisdiction that the shootist hit a bank, we would send out our communications to the other offices as, as quickly as possible, providing them with whatever information we have in the way of you know, maybe some new clues or new witnesses or, or any better surveillance photographs. From the photos, the task force determines the shootist likely uses a Smith & Wesson 38 revolver, 
a handgun popular with police departments. Investigators also notice he indexes his finger on the side of his weapon, just as officers are trained to do. It's an ominous possibility. The shootist might be a cop. You, come here! Even if he's not an officer, he seems to know how they operate. Investigators suspect he goes as far as surveilling local officers to learn their patrol routes, and then chooses targets away from those routes to increase police response time. The elusive gunman treats bank robbery like a profession, and his planning is paid off in more than 20 robberies. Investigators welcome the continuing media coverage. They know their best chance of finding the shootist might be through the public's help. One witness in particular provides an interesting lead. After the 1989 heist in Mission Viejo, a resident near the Rob Bank saw a man climb into the trunk of a car, which then sped off. He described the car as a red four-door with California plates, but he didn't see the driver or get the plate number. Agents run checks on every car that fits the description in California, but there are thousands. It would take months to track down each car. But the sighting does confirm one suspicion. When we found out that uh, he was getting into the trunk of a vehicle, we knew that he obviously had a, an accomplice in these robberies. On March 30th, 1990, the shootist robs the same Texas bank he hit a year earlier. To investigators, the repeat job means he's getting even more brash, unafraid of being recognized by anyone. By the end of 1990, the task force ties the shooters to 27 robberies that have netted him nearly $400,000, all without a single usable print left behind. He was very cautious about vaulting the counters, not to touch things. Even going out the doors, he would hit the doors with his elbows or his, his hip to push them open. Somehow, agents need to find a way into the shootist's secretive world. They take the case to behavioral profilers at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. It's not that it's going to be able to place a name on the individual, but it'll kind of give us a little bit more about the guy's personality. Studying details of each known robbery, the FBI profiler creates a behavioral sketch of the shootist. Because most criminals start working in their comfort zone, the profiler suspects the shootist is from Texas, where the first robberies occurred. The gunman's level of precision indicates possible military training. Since the shootist has gone so long without anyone turning him in, the profiler suggests the robber has only one fiercely loyal accomplice. And experience with other takeover robbers makes the profiler believe the shootist will grow more violent as his spree continues. It's possible the gunman will choose a shootout over surrender. This guy's gonna be willing to shoot his way out of the bank or even take hostages to, to make an escape from the bank if he's cornered. In April 1991, did you actually see a gun? The shootist expands his turf into Northern California, robbing a San Jose bank of $15,000. OK, did he shoot the guy? San Jose Detective Sergeant Jack Baxter. We never found a witness as to where he went, what kind of car he had, did he have accomplices. Uh, we had no idea. This time, the shootist leaves something behind. A partial palm print is found on the counter. But investigators can't make a match. Law enforcement agencies don't include palm prints in their files. The task force is back to square one. Two months later, the shootist robs a bank in Bellevue, Washington, just outside Seattle. He's expanding his territory. Seattle was now in the loop. Now we knew that he was broadening his horizons and moving on to other states. Uh, 
The elusive bandit is one of the most prolific and widespread robbers in modern FBI history. By 1991, the five-year statute of limitations expires on his earliest robberies, so he can't be charged for them. Agents are racing the clock. Well, he was a, a violent multi-state bank robber who was very successful, been hitting every uh, six to eight weeks, and no one had a, a clue as to who he was or where he was from. In August, the shootist robs a bank in Los Altos, California, bringing his known total to $474,457. Investigators find a solid clue, a false mustache. It's the first evidence recovered that might be physically linked directly to the shootist. But at the time, DNA analysis is expensive and time consuming, and they have no suspect profile to compare it to. Unfortunately, that wasn't of any evidentiary value to us other than the fact that we confirmed that he was wearing a disguise, obviously. By the end of 1991, investigators linked the shootist to 33 armed robberies in 18 cities. Investigators have nothing. They need a break, and soon. Investigating the longest string of unsolved bank robberies in modern FBI history, agents have little but grainy photos of the man they call the shootist. In them, they see the robber is wearing something beneath his shirt. FBI Special Agent Jack Kelly. At first, we thought it might have been body armor, but under closer scrutiny, it, it appeared that this thing was really covering the lower abdomen and back portion of his body. It could be a brace, meaning the shootist might have a bad back. Although he really didn't display that with his ability to, to vault the teller counters. But these back braces were probably just to support his ability to be able to do that. Determined to run down every lead, Investigators contact chiropractors in the areas near the banks, but they have only blurry surveillance photos of a disguised man, and they can't get to every doctor in three states. And there's quite a few chiropractors, but we did cover as many as we possibly could, and we really didn't have any luck. It's another dead end in the years-long search for the mysterious bandit. 1992 brings seven more shootist heists including the repeat robbery of the bank in Bellevue, Washington. New total, nearly $600,000. Seattle FBI Special Agent Don Glasser. Tried to process the bank for fingerprints, uh, extensive interviews of the witnesses. And uh, of course, our fondant wildest hope would that someone would say, yes, I saw them get into a specific car. But no one saw anything. There is this concern that you're not serving the public well, that here's a man that's allowed to come in and do a bank robbery and fire a shot, and eventually there could be an accident or an intentional shooting. And, uh, you know, you, you feel it's frustration that you didn't do everything you could, although you can't think of anything else that to be done. They must stop the shootings before he graduates to murder. During a heist in San Jose, the shootist's luck begins to wane. This time, before he vanishes, the bank security camera catches the best shots yet of his face. A San Jose police forensic artist uses the photos to build a composite sketch of what the shootist would look like without his disguises. Recreating features that are obscured requires a thorough knowledge of human physiology and a remarkable artistic eye. Agents blanket the target areas with the sketch, asking Crime Stopper programs to air it regularly and placing it in dozens of banks. San Jose Detective Sergeant Jack Baxter. We thought that uh, in order to get this guy, we needed the help of the community. We needed somebody to call in with information, something that they had seen or heard. On May 11, 1994, investigators get the break they need. An anonymous caller says he knows the shootist, though it's no slam dunk. 
the information was fairly generic. The name that was given was, was Johnny Williams or John Williams, and then he also supposedly used the name of Robert Hall. The caller says Williams is about 40 years old, drives a red four-door, and has a devoted accomplice, his wife. He says Williams is always armed, has a hair-trigger temper, and has vowed never to be taken alive. In fact, he and his wife have a suicide pact if they're ever cornered. This is a good tip, but the case is far from over. Those names are so common that there were literally hundreds of Johnny Williams and Robert Halls uh, that we had to go through. And we tried to narrow the list down to the ones that were approximately the same age as, our, as uh, the caller had given. Agents cull through California DMV records and find a Johnny Madison Williams and a Robert Hall that appear in their photos to be the same man. They then compare the photos to the composite sketch. It was an exact match for the sketch done by our police artist, just as if he had done it right off the picture. So we knew that uh, we had the right guy. California fingerprints drivers. The DMV fingerprint records confirm Hall and Williams are the same man. Johnny Madison Williams is a former Marine from Texas and has a record for robbery and theft there. Williams' wife, Carol, bought a 38 revolver like the one in bank security footage. And Carol drives a red four-door registered in her maiden name. Investigators find no legitimate source of income, yet the couple lives in a $350,000 house overlooking the ocean in Los Osos, California. FBI Special Agent Jim Wilkins. The area where he was living was on high ground overlooking Morro Bay. It was an affluent area that actually had one road in. It's an exposed area where agents might stand out as strangers. We did not know where Johnny Williams was at the time. Despite the risk, FBI agents have to check the house. They find a spot they hope is obscured and set up surveillance. We knew he carried a weapon. We knew he would use it. We also had information from the anonymous tipster that he carried that weapon all the time. The agents see no sign that anyone's at the house. The team watches and waits. We had made a contingency plan that if we saw Williams returning in that vehicle, we would do a felony car stop before he got into the neighborhood where we had safe fields of fire and where there were no escape routes for him in his vehicle. Agents watch the house for several days, but the couple fails to show. Investigators suspect the shootist is off preparing for another heist. Jack Kelly has a hunch it will be in the Seattle area. The shootist is robbed there in one year intervals, and the year is up. Kelly contacts Seattle Special Agent Don Glasser. He said, it's definitely going to happen. He's going to definitely rob in your area. So be on the lookout. It's just a hunch, but it's all they have. Glasser hits the streets looking for the red car. I was out of the office and on the street so I could be in the vicinity of the Bellevue area. Getting very antsy, very excited about being prepared to respond to a dispatch saying that there was a, a 91, uh, a bank robbery. July 1st, 1994, the shootist strikes again. He robs a bank in Kirkland, Washington, just 10 miles north of where Special Agent Glasser is on patrol looking for him. After his trademark gunshot, the shootist orders a teller to load his bag with cash. As before, he warns against bait bills or dye packs and threatens to shoot if she tries anything. The teller accidentally drops wooden paperweights in the bag, which the shootist mistakes for dye packs. He's enraged.
July 1st, 1994, the shootist commits his 48th bank robbery. A frightened teller angers the robber, but she is spared. The gunman runs out without firing another shot and disappears before police and the FBI can respond. Investigators get word of the latest robbery. Special Agent Jack Kelly's hunch about Seattle was right. We knew where he was at this point, at least what vicinity of the country he was in, in the general Seattle area. Kelly has already flagged Williams' credit cards, so he'll be notified if one is used. Just after the Kirkland robbery, the plan works. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to get some information from one particular credit card company that had a recent transaction up in the state of Washington at a particular hotel up there. Seattle Special Agent Don Glasser rushes to the hotel. I went up there very excited. I know now we've got some real good information. The hotel is in Basel, 10 miles from the latest robbed bank. Johnny Williams used a credit card in the name of his alias, Robert Hall, to check in. But there's no guarantee he's still there. I drove through the parking lot. I saw the red card sitting in the parking lot, nose in, in the parking space. When Glasser calls in the plate number, it comes back registered to Carol Williams under her maiden name of Hawkins. If Williams is still in the hotel, they must be careful not to tip him off or create a barricade or hostage situation. Listen, what I really need from you is I need you to look at this picture, okay? I need you to tell me if... The manager recognizes suspect Johnny Williams as Robert Hall and says he and his wife have not checked out. So I immediately called Jack Kelly back. I gave him the news and suggested he get an airplane and fly north, and he was already packing his bags. At that point in the investigation, uh, I was very excited. I contacted my counterpart, Jack Baxter, from the San Jose PD, told him they had the guy, not only we got him identified, but also we know where he is. So Jack hopped on a plane, and I hopped on a plane. Glasser also calls for reinforcements yes, from the Seattle right. police and FBI. Okay, here in at the hotel. We made sure that none of our agents here. wore uh, radios, guns, raid jackets, yes. FBI ball caps, any kind of identifying, um, ask them to act normal when they're moving around. Within minutes, more agents and detectives quietly arrive and set up a perimeter. We made sure that no FBI four-door, as we call them, G-rides were visible to this guy, that we would use surveillance vehicles. If we happen to casually look out his window, he wouldn't see anything unusual happening outside. We set up locations that completely surrounding the, the hotel. We rented a couple rooms that would give us a, a base to operate from. So there was no way that he would walk out. If he detected us, then he might try and escape. And we made sure we had it really covered. Rather than rush the room, the investigators decide to wait until they get a visual ID of Williams. We had made sure we had an eyeball on his door at all times. By nightfall, Detective Baxter and Special Agent Kelly arrive from California. Detective Jack Baxter. We didn't want to move too fast. We had to have patience, and we wanted to make sure we could arrest him in a way that nobody was going to get hurt. The agents want to take Williams into custody outside his room in case he has guns inside. As, as dinner time approached, we hoped that we'd see him come down and go to eat or something like that. And we were prepared to arrest him if he did that. But hours pass with no sign of Williams or his wife. While they watch, investigators have to stay under the shootist's radar and not use police radios. We had been told he had a scanner, so we had to be careful what we said on the radio uh, for fear of tipping him off that, that we were there. It does appear someone is in the room. Special Agent Jack Kelly. 
we knew that there was a light on in there. We could see the light, and all the drapes were drawn, and we could see the flashing of the television in there. After seven years, agents and police may finally have the shooters cornered. After an eight-year search, the FBI believes they have traced Johnny Madison Williams, the shootist, to a Washington State hotel room. A full day and night of surveillance passes with no movement from the room. In the morning, agents devise a ruse to see if their suspect is actually there. They recruit a hotel employee to help. Investigators show the man what their target looks like and ask him to knock on the door to ask a maintenance question and get a good look at whoever's inside. Despite the danger, the employee has to act natural. If Williams gets spooked, he could turn violent. I need to change your filter. When the door opens, the hotel employee asks when would be a good time to change the room's air filters. Detective Jack Baxter. Our suspect told him that he was going to leave in an hour so he could come back in an hour and change the filters. Well, he ran back to us and positively identified him as being in the room. We had the room secured, so there's no way he was going to get out. Now they know the shootist is definitely there. And in an hour, he should emerge. I want everybody in place in 45. An hour passes. Then two. Williams could be on to them. But then an opportunity presents itself. Special Agent Jack Kelly. There was a phone call from that room down to the front desk, and uh, he had asked if he could borrow a typewriter because he wanted to write a letter to someone. And he was asking the people at the front desk if they could bring the typewriter up to the room. He instructed them not to do that. On the FBI's order, the manager tells Williams he's welcome to use the typewriter in an office near the front desk. Which he agreed to. Say be down shortly. The small office is a good place for an arrest, away from the public, no chance of escape. Special Agent Don Glasser. We quickly go to the room, decide where the typewriter's gonna be, do a little quick rearranging of furniture so that we can go into that room once he's in there and not be obstructed by furniture. We have a nice clean path to get to him. As a final touch, Investigators place a sheet listing the Miranda arrest rights in the typewriter, then hide in an adjacent room and wait for the word from their men outside. After 40 tense minutes, a man leaves the room and heads toward the front desk. It's Johnny Williams. But we saw him walking across the parking lot absolutely no question in our mind that is him we recognized him as if he were our best friend he just left his room he's on his way to the lobby this is it the culmination of an eight-year chase he walked into the front desk and they instructed him to go over to this office mr williams the office is right so we walked behind the front desk and went over there. Williams is cornered, cut off from escape. Agents know he is dangerous. They are prepared for the worst. completely caught off guard. Agents take him into custody without a struggle. He is unarmed. Because of the investigator's careful planning, it's a perfectly quiet arrest. I called him by his true name. I said, you know, Johnny Madison Williams Jr., you know, it's over. And he, his head kind of dropped. Next, agents have to get William's wife, Carol. We figured there was no reason to 
charge into the room, but we just wait long enough, and she would come down. In fact, she did. She came out of the room and she was going to her car. And we just stepped out and took her into custody there without incident. Freeze, FBI, you're under arrest. Place your hands where I can see them. Place them on top of the car. Once again, a safe arrest. Now agents go looking for evidence. He provided a consent to search his room. And uh, in that room, he had a couple scanners. He had uh, handy talkies. He had disguises. He had money. They also discover the shootist's own notes, a log of all his robberies. There was a gray briefcase that had a, a detailed record of the bank robberies, very, very organized, the date, the uh, day of the week, information on the total, the address of the bank, the name of the as bank, very, very, very uh, incriminating evidence. Investigators find more in William's car. He had two pistols and they were in the trunk of his car. We recognized the four inch 38 revolver from the pictures, surveillance pictures. We knew we had the right weapon. He had a two inch revolver that we hadn't seen before. Both of them were loaded. The investigators separate Williams and his wife while they await transport to an FBI office for booking. Williams agrees to talk. We linked him to, I think, a total of 48 robberies. And when I did the interview, he asked me, he says, how many do you have me for? I said, well, how many do you think we have you for, John? He says, oh, he says, you know, you wouldn't be here arresting me and know my name and everything else. You probably have all 56. Williams goes on to detail each of the 48 robberies the FBI know about, plus eight they don't. The entire interview eventually lasted about 12 hours, and I was writing constantly. I mean, I had writer's cramp at the end of the, uh, the 12 hours with all the information he was providing. Johnny Madison Williams took his work seriously, casing banks for weeks, outlining intricate escape plans. He says he wore the brace after injuring his back in a car accident and frequented chiropractors just not the ones investigators got to. Knowing the FBI would try to trace his disguises, he stocked up in Dallas before he started his robbery spree. He tells agents he studied police routes, radio dispatch codes. All that work brought him close to a million dollars in stolen cash until authorities stopped him. Yet it wasn't just the agents and officers working the case who solved it. Many times it's the assistance of the public that, that leads to the capture and, and uh, successful resolution of these cases. It's very important. I think no more so than now with the terrorism threat. Is that important? Carol Williams pleads guilty and receives 20 years for her role in the shootest robberies. Her husband, Johnny Madison Williams, the shootist himself, also pleads guilty to the 27 robberies still under the statute of limitations. He is sentenced to 92 years in federal prison. His unprecedented reign finally over.